The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Could one family solve the riddle of schizophrenia? I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the agenda in the summer, journalist and author Robert Kolker is here to explain why modern medicine hoped so. A family is not meant to be a perfect research project. But when six of the Galvin family's 12 children were found to have schizophrenia, medical science couldn't resist. Investigative journalist Robert Kolker lays out that shocking story in his new book. It's called Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family. And Robert Kolker joins us now from Brooklyn, New York. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me back. Um, so last night, you told us the story of the Galvin family in Colorado Springs. Twelve children over 20 years, and six of them had schizophrenia. Remind us, what was it like in that house on Hidden Valley Road? Well, th this is a, a family of 12 children born over 20 years. And um, shortly after the 12th one uh, was born, the, the, the oldest started to break down with psychotic breaks and have schizophrenia, and they weren't sure if it was something in the drinking water or uh, something about the way uh, the kids were brought up. At the time, there wasn't a good genetic understanding of the disease, and there were lots of debates within the field about the origin of it. And so it was almost like a, a case of demonic possession. They weren't sure who was going to be next or what they were possibly doing wrong. So there was a lot of fear and a lot of secrecy and a lot of denial and a lot of hope that the boys would somehow grow out of it. But then the tra tragedies escalated and, and the younger children became traumatized by what was happening. And, and it was only years later that they were able to start to find some clarity when the first researchers started to study them. And throughout the next, uh, over the next half hour, we'll talk more about that. Now, when the oldest son, Donald, was first diagnosed, it was 1965. At the time, what did the medical world understand about schizophrenia? Um, at that time, about half of uh, the psychiatric field in America was blaming mothers for schizophrenia and for other mental illnesses as well. But for schizophrenia, there was a, a term called the schizophrenogenic mother that mm -hmm. became popular uh, in 1948 and really stayed popular until about 1980. A lot of doctors, a lot of psychiatrists were trained with this theory that mothers sent weird, you know, contradictory double message, meaning messages to their children, and that the, if it happened enough, the children would be so traumatized that they would create an imaginary world and dive into that world to protect themselves. That was the explanation for schizophrenia that a lot of the therapeutic establishment really believed at that time. Uh, and that meant that people like Don and Mimi Galvin, the parents in the Galvin family, would have been blamed for what was going on. And that was not uh, that only made a stigmatized disease that much more stigmatized. The other half had become in, enthralled by Thorazine and other um, psychoactive medications that were getting online that, that, were, that were coming onto the market that seemed to be managing the symptoms of schizophrenia, seemed to be tamping down the delusions and hallucinations and making patients more manageable. And there was a period in the late 60s and early 70s when a lot of doctors were convinced that this was the miracle drug, that it was going to be like, like insulin for diabetes, that, that it was the chemical that was going to rectify things in these patients. But in fact, what it did was it just suppressed the symptoms enough to make them more manageable patients and allow them to leave sanitariums. It, it didn't really cure them. It didn't roll back the clock for them. And, and yet it was good enough for the, there to be no real innovation from those medicines from that time forward. And so it was kind of a slow motion tragedy for patients on those drugs. Those were the choices for the Galvins in the 60s. And the things didn't really budge for them for a very, very long time. Um, there's a part in the book, towards the end of the book, where Mimi says, you know, um, she tried to be a good mother. She, made, I think, she baked cake, made jello pudding. When you, when she, 
When she felt like she was being blamed for her children's condition, she internalized that. How would you describe how she raised her children? Well, she sort of doubled down on the perfectionism that she always had as a mother. She was determined uh, that that all of the children, especially the well ones, project a perfect um, image to the outside world. And so she wanted that to continue, even though um, inside the house things were going uh, completely out of her control. And she would laugh off anything that, that the public would find out about. She would say, oh, we're just an eccentric family, or oh, my children would never do that. But uh, of course, the neighbors knew something was up. It, it was a very um, open secret in the community. Um, but uh, the worst of it did manage to stay hidden until tragedy struck. There was a murder-suicide, and there was um, uh, a, a various psychotic breaks and, and things that couldn't be denied. And that's when uh, Mimi sort of switched over to become the champion of her sick uh, sons and really take up the mantle for them and be their advocate in the mental health community. Um, it's almost like she diverted her perfectionism into a cause at that point. While, you, while you're telling this story of the Galvin family, you also wrote uh, a parallel story of scientists working to understand this neurological condition. Um, and the central question they had to contend with was whether schizophrenia was caused by nature or nurture. Has that been answered? Has that question been answered? The debate keeps on modulating. I mean, we, we know now for sure that there is a genetic basis to this illness, but we still don't know so much. We, we don't know what the genes are. Um, the more genes we find that seem to be a player in schizophrenia, um, the more complicated it becomes. There are at least more than 100 that seem to be players in what's going on. And by 100 genes, I mean 100 different genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. So it, it gets a little a little complicated. And then, of course, there's the idea that they're, that genes aren't destiny. They're just a blueprint for what happens to you uh, as your body matures. And so a lot of it is still affected by the environment. There are some genes that are only expressed by environmental factors like trauma or perhaps drug use or, or other, other things that we don't know about. And, and so the nature-nurture conversation continues. I, I thought it was a useful thing to dial into that because it was exactly the heart of the matter for the Galvins, because if they had gone public in the late 60s about what was happening to their sons, everyone would have said that this was a nurture problem. They would say, well, what did you do to these children? What did you do wrong? I mean, the family would have been a shambles. And so they chose to be optimistic. They chose to believe that things would get better because people were so convinced about nurture. My book talks about a lot of the, the nature side of it, a lot of the search for genetic roots of the disease. And there are a lot of heroes in that story. And some of those people end up meeting the Galvins themselves and doing work that really moves the ball forward on schizophrenia. Um, I'd like to read a passage from Hidden Valley Road where you talk about the medications the sons were prescribed. You write, it was a little too early, however, to declare victory in the nature-nurture war. With talk therapy on the ropes, neuroleptic drugs were ascendant. These drugs changed the lives of thousands of people, helping them create some space between themselves and their delusions. In the popular imagination, and even among many doctors, neuroleptics were considered revelatory, like insulin for diabetes. But how could that be when schizophrenia itself remained ragingly mysterious and the drugs themselves could be physically damaging? For the chronically mentally ill, success had been defined down to a point where it was starting to look a lot like failure. How did uh, neuroleptic drugs work? Um, I don't want to be glib, but we aren't sure how neuroleptic drugs work. There are theories about how it works, but the original one that was such a miracle, or seemingly a miracle for schizophrenia at the time, Thorazine, was developed as a battle battlefield anesthetic, and it's just happened to have a narcotic effect that that seemed to help people with schizophrenia. And so by looking at what it did to the brain, people had hypotheses about dopamine. But then another drug came along called clozapine that kind of did the sep something completely different with dopamine. Dopamine is a is a you know is a brain uh, transmitting mechanism that they think was a player, but that can't be the whole story. Um, it, it's a little like aspirin or some of these other drugs where, where we know the drug can do certain things, but we aren't sure still exactly why. 
and and the book charts how how scientists using MRIs and PET scans and CAT scans and finally the Human Genome Project are or trying like the Dickens to try to get to the bottom of exactly what was going on with these drugs. It becomes a, a game of whack-a-mole or trial and error. Uh, with each patient is a little different, and you try different drugs to see what helps. But there is no real roadmap uh, or mechanism for understanding whether somebody would benefit better from clozapine or thorazine or Haldol or stelazine. It, it, it's uh, it's frustratingly mysterious even now. Did uh, newer medications overcome that problem? The newer medications are all just descendants of the original medications. There's been no game-changing drug for schizophrenia since the, the 50s or 60s, and that's the frustrating thing uh, about this illness. It, it's, it's a combination of factors. There's the fact that the people with schizophrenia can't really advocate for themselves. Um, there's a, that social stigma uh, that keeps them uh, sort of off on the fringes of society. Uh, a lot of families aren't like the Galvins. They collapse when there's schizophrenia, so it's not like the family members can advocate for them. But most importantly, the pharmaceutical industry isn't motivated to innovate because drugs like Thorazine or Clozapine, they're, they're good enough. They, they manage the symptoms, and so there's been no call for anything revolutionary that makes life even better. It also is expensive and risky to test these drugs because you can't test them on animals because mice right. don't get schizophrenia. You, you have to test it on humans, and that's a big risk as well. Right. I was just going to say that um, about the rats. Do you think that as a society, because you and I, um, when because we're healthy-ish individuals, it seems as if our ambitions are acknowledged. But when it comes to people who are struggling with mental illness, their ambitions or their dreams are kind of sidelined. So do you think, as a society, we all need to rethink how we uh, look at mental illness? Certainly. Mental illness exists on a spectrum. And, and there are people who are really um, completely compromised by whatever issues that they have. But the, that is not everyone. You know, neurodiversity is a term that we use sometimes for, for autism and for other conditions where, where we, we, we determine, and rightly so, that, that someone with a, what might have been pathologized as a medical condition many years ago might actually just be someone who thinks differently from the so-called norm. And there are some people who might have been um, classified as, with schizophrenia years ago and institutionalized who might not have needed that kind of extreme reaction who might be benefiting from the neurodiversity model. You don't have to give everyone with schizophrenia the same prescription. You don't have to throw all of them into asylums. Uh, it's not a cookie cutter illness. And, and more than that, we, we don't even know exactly what the illness is yet. It's a syndrome of symptoms that we've classified into schizophrenia, but there is overlap with bipolar illness. There is overlap with autism and uh, potentially with depression and anxiety as well. Uh, the, a lot of this might exist on a spectrum. The genetic work that's being done on that is finding more, more associations between these conditions uh, seemingly every year. You write in the book, you mentioned the heroes in the book who are uh, calling for a better understanding of schizophrenia. And researchers were quite excited about studying the Galvins. How did the siblings advance the understanding of schizophrenia? Well, by the 70s, by the time the doctors who met the Galvins were first training and, and becoming specialists in their field, it became clear among more and more people in, the, in psychiatry that, that schizophrenia had a genetic basis, that even if you believe bad mothering had something to do with it, that you also knew that there was something genetic. But it seemed like a ridiculous thing to try to get to the bottom of that, because it seemed like there were so many genes involved that you would never find the culprit. Instead, most psychiatrists who were interested in genetics were, were going after things that seemed a lot more simple, a lot more easier to knock out. Otherwise, you would waste your whole career on it. The heroes in my book are Lynn DeLisi from the National Institute of Mental Health and Robert Friedman from the University of Colorado Hospital in Denver, and they were working independently. But they both had the you know, off-kilter idea to actually try and find out what was going on genetically with schizophrenia when everybody else was working on something else. Um, and there was not the technology to go looking for the genes. There were MRIs and PET scans and CT scans, but, but 
DNA hadn't even been sequenced yet. Uh, they, or, and so it was really hard to imagine ever be able to get to the bottom of it. But they both decided that they would look for families. What if they found families with a lot of incidents of schizophrenia? And that would be a much smaller haystack to go looking for needles in. And so very quickly in the mid 80s, they one of the first families they land on are the Galvins. And, and they, they were referred by a, a chapter of the National uh, Alliance on Mental Illness. And um, it, it, they were really the perfect family to study because not only were there so many people with the illness, but they were intact. They were around. They they weren't scattered to the winds or, or homeless, um, and and uh, and so they were very early um, uh, participants in studies that ended up uh, leading to major innovation. With the Human Genome Project underway in 1995, you wrote about a really interesting meeting at the National Academy of Sciences where lead researchers came together to talk about schizophrenia. At this meeting, a leader at the National Institutes of Health chastised these researchers, saying, quote, you people have been studying this disease for 30 years, and from where I sit, you have accomplished virtually nothing. Was that a fair assessment? You know, it... It was a little tough, but I think it, it was a very strong point. You know, you had no real new drugs for decades uh, to help people. There were no real um, genetic advances, despite all the MRI work. Um, there was lots of studies going on that showed how the phys brain physically was different with people with schizophrenia. But in a way, that was kind of worthless, because anybody who talks to someone with schizophrenia for five minutes knows that their brain is different. Um, it, it, it was clear that uh, at the time, the Human Genome Project was so promising that it seemed like everybody else had been just digging in the wrong hole, looking for, the, for treasure in the wrong place, and that they finally had found out where the treasure was going to be. Now, the big um, sad revelation is that even the Human Genome Project didn't solve the problem of schizophrenia. It just uh, created more questions. What questions did it create? Well, the, the whole idea of the Human Genome Project just very, very briefly, is that if you know what a so-called normal human genetic blueprint looks like, you could sort of compare it to somebody who has schizophrenia, and the theory would be uh, that the person with schizophrenia would have a couple genetic mutations in there that would stick out like sore thumbs, and you'd be done by dinner. Like, you'd have found the problem, and then you could spend a few years working on a drug that could manipulate that genetic mutation, and you'd cure the disease. And, and they went after any number of diseases this way, starting with Huntington's disease and, and a lot of other single genetic mutation diseases. The problem is that they did find something for uh, schizophrenia, and then they found something else, and then something else, and now they found uh, more than 130 different genetic mutations, all of which have a very small effect on what um, uh, on, on the possibility of a person developing schizophrenia. So in a way, it's a bunch of trivialities that add up to something only slightly less trivial. And, and it's frustrating because uh, so much time and effort has gone into it. The people who are studying the genome say that they're only just getting warmed up and that they might continue to find something. So they're still at it. But meanwhile, um, researchers like Linda Lisi and, um, and, and Robert Friedman um, are focusing on what could be a much more manageable uh, set of data, which is families like the Galvins, uh, where you know they have the illness, and you can compare different family members and see what they share and try to understand how uh, schizophrenia works in their particular brains. And when you know that information, what can you then do? Well, the idea would be that whatever genetic mutation the Galvins have is happening in a part of the brain that is crucial uh, to brain function and that when it's compromised can lead to an issue like schizophrenia. And if we can target that part of the brain, then we can go looking in that part of the brain with other people and find out perhaps if there's some way to you know, medicate or otherwise make the brain resilient. Robert Friedman's all about resilience. He understands that schizophrenia is a developmental illness and that if you have the genetic vulnerability to developing schizophrenia, that doesn't mean you necessarily get it if you can make your brain more resilient at a young age. And he's landed on the idea of nutritional supplements taken in utero you know, by expectant mothers for their children that could make 
uh, the children more resilient and not develop severe mental illness. And they're in the middle of a long-term study now to see if he's right. And what is that, um, what is it called again? I, I remember it started with CH. It's choline. Uh, uh, the, the irony of choline is that it, you can buy it at any vitamin store. Um, it's, not, it's nothing that a pharmaceutical company can make or patent. And it's non-toxic and, and taken in large amounts. It's no problem. And um, they're trying it with, um, with, with mothers now. And uh, the children in those studies are a few years old now, and are, the data is looking really good. But we really won't know for many, many years you know, whether this is a game changer or not. Um, in the book, you talk about how the Galvin brothers would have been treated if they were born half a century later. What would that treatment look like today? Well, I, I think looking back in hindsight, that the, a lot of the tragedy of the Galvins is that many of the boys had early warning signs that were ignored. And I think the difference today is that those warning signs might not have been ignored, uh, that, that at the age of 15, they would have caught uh, some really erratic behavior and tried to nip it in the bud. And that through a combination of drugs used judiciously, not just thrown at the problem, and therapy that could help uh, you know, cognitively help a, the, the patient sort of manage their symptoms, it might stave off further psychotic breaks and make their lives a lot more livable, a lot more manageable. Early intervention is really um, a major trend now that, that it, it gives a lot of hope to families. The other thing that gives hope to families is family support. There was no mechanism to help the Galvin family through this back then, but I've talked to uh, you know, mental health caregivers now in places where you know the patients are lucky enough to actually have good health care. And a lot of what the doctors do is support the families and help them uh, help the, the sick family members. So people feel a little less alone, a little less in the shadows. But um, there's a lot of despair as well. I mean, we all know that a lot of the mentally ill are on our streets and are chemical abusers because they're self-medicating, because the alternatives are not there for them. We also know that the jails are huge mental health providers in our society, um, uh, and that a lot of mental health patients without the resources are sort of on a revolving door between the streets and jail. And, and that's a, a tragedy of, of huge magnitude. And we've also uh, heard on the news of police responding to a mental health crisis, and it goes horribly wrong. And that happened a couple times in the book as well. Um, and the point that you were saying about the family, like not having a place to go, in a way, Mimi was a hero in the fact that she did keep her family together and her children were together. They weren't on the street. This is the wonderful complexity of this family story. You have a a mother who who really chooses to help her six sons at the expense of her well children, and the well children feel neglected and and even abandoned by their mother. On the other hand, the mother keeps the family together and and allows for the family to be studied one day, which could potentially help any number of people, and um, definitely helps you know the, the the sick sons, and and so you see that that her denial has a purpose, that her, her tunnel vision was actually a certain amount of tenacity. She was not going to uh, stop trying to care for the most vulnerable children in her family. How is the family doing today? Well, they are amazed by the response to the book, and so am I. I'm getting lots of email from, and I'm passing it along to them, of people who have mental illness in their family, people who were stigmatized years ago, um, people who have lots of hope that a book like this can really shine a light on things. Uh, they feel like they have a lot of company now and that they, they feel a little less alone. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, and of course, you know, these are people who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, and, and they're in this group portrait of a family. So a lot of it is stuff that happened so long ago. They're, they're just, uh, some of it is news to them because uh, it includes interviews with people who remember things that they weren't there for. So I've heard from some siblings saying, thank you, I, I never knew about this particular part, and I never knew that so much of this happened. And, and that's been quite interesting as well. Um, I want to point out that you dedicated this book to your mother. How did your mother affect you in writing this book? Well, my mother was a psychiatric professional, but she was not 
a, a theoretician. She didn't come home and talk about Sigmund Freud um, or about the schizophrenogenic mother. Mm -hmm. um, she was a, a psychiatric counselor at our local hospital. So she had a she was uh, helping out with with group therapies and with running um, the psych unit in our hospital, people who were experiencing trauma. Um, and she uh, was very, very good at listening. And I think that while specifically for this book, she was excited and we were talking a lot before she died in 2018 about the about the book itself. But really, in a much more global way, it was her modeling amazing listening skills that really helped me in my life as a reporter um, and as an interviewer. Um, I, I understood the value in being sort of an active listener and to be open to what people were saying and not immediately judgmental and not prosecutorial. Um, she really lived that every day of her life and, and was a great example to me and everyone around her. Um, and I think for journalists, for reporters, you, our goal is to tell stories, and in that we do listen a lot. Seeing the feedback that you're getting and how this family's tragedy is helping so many people, what does that feel like for you? Um, I'm, I think that the goal with any big nonfiction project like this is to, is to write about an unfamiliar world and an unfamiliar experience, and then find what's relatable about it. Um, help people understand that it, that that the people in the book aren't so different from them, and help them walk a mile in the shoes of the people of the book. And so I'm just uh, I'm over the moon that 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 seems to be happening here. That 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 even if you don't have severe mental illness in your family, you can look at a family that experiences tragedy, and we all have tragedy in our lives, and you can see how they deal with it, and you can try to. Uh, sort of scan the book for for tips and for information on on how uh, how they managed how they made it through. And what was Mimi's famous words? Uh, you can't be heartbroken every day. Exactly. Which you know still is amazing to me. Robert, thank you so much for your time and congratulations on this book. It's fantastic. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much for talking with me. I'm really happy to talk to you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you, thank you.